Hello, I'm Joel Tickner, a professor of environmental health at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and executive director of the Association for the Advancement of Alternatives Assessment, a new professional society for the field. I'll be walking us through this last session of the training. In this session, we will focus on the last steps of an assessment of alternatives, including processes for making decisions and implementing those decisions. Alternatives assessment is an action-oriented approach where a decision has already been made about the need to substitute a chemical of concern. As a result, the goal of the alternatives assessment process is not only a thoughtful assessment, but also instituting actions to implement safer, more sustainable substitutes. I'll be primarily using the term alternatives assessment throughout this module. However, as noted in earlier sessions, the terms assessment of alternatives, alternatives analysis, and analysis of alternatives are often used interchangeably and have the same meaning. Learning objectives for this session include understanding the importance of establishing decision criteria, revisiting those that were established in the scoping phase of the assessment, knowing specific strategies and decision support tools to help navigate uncertainty in the assessment, to address inevitable trade-offs, and to determine the preferred alternatives, knowing the importance of transparency when documenting the results of the assessment, knowing approaches for promoting the adoption of preferred alternatives, and understanding strategies for continuous improvement and for developing research and innovation plans if no preferred alternative is identified. We're approaching the end of this training, the last steps of assessing alternatives. We'll be discussing the final step of the assessment when final comparisons between options and decisions are made about a preferred alternative. We'll also discuss implementation. The assessment of alternatives doesn't end when decisions are made, but when preferred options are implemented. Like in previous sessions, this is an overview on topics such as decision analysis, which is a field unto itself. We won't be going into great detail on specific methodological approaches or tools. However, we have prepared another resource handout to accompany this session with useful links to additional information and details. First, we'll discuss various strategies for comparing alternatives, considering uncertainties and potential trade-offs between options, as well as making a final decision about the availability of safer feasible alternatives and which options make the most sense to move towards implementation. At this point in the assessment process, you should have one, identified and possibly conducted an initial screen of potential alternatives, two, assessed and compared these alternatives based on their physiochemical properties, hazard characteristics, intrinsic exposure potential, technical feasibility, economic feasibility, and if possible, potential life cycle trade-offs. Those strategies and tools to address these are not addressed in this training. You've gained knowledge about the merits and potential problems or the pros and cons of the identified alternatives based on the endpoints and assessment criteria examined through these individual assessments. Now it's time to integrate all of this information, hazards, exposure potential, performance and cost to assess trade-offs among the options and ultimately make a substitution decision. A typical alternatives assessment may deal with dozens of different attributes a more detailed assessment may have even more attributes to consider, for example, if life cycle impacts are included. It is very uncommon for one alternative to be superior to all others on all criteria. Some trade-offs will likely exist. For example, one alternative may be preferable from a health and safety perspective, for example, hazard and exposure potential, but doesn't perform as well on a critical technical feasibility criterion. Another alternative may be preferable from a human health perspective, for example, low hazard on key criteria such as carcinogenicity, reproductive or developmental toxicity, or neurotoxicity, but it is of concern for aquatic toxicity. One alternative may not be preferable given purchase or reformulation costs compared to others, 
but is considered more cost effective over a longer time horizon given durability characteristics. One alternative may be more energy intensive than others, but less toxic. As a result, it is critical to identify these trade-offs to understand which are critical, which may be reduced, and which are acceptable trade-offs. There are some additional challenges with regards to comparing and choosing preferred alternatives, including different types of data. When considering the range of attributes assessed across all of the four main components of assessing alternatives, results will likely be a combination of qualitative and quantitative information. For some attributes, there may be significantly more data and experience available than for others. Uncertainty. Data quality, reliability, and missing data are additional factors that create complexities in understanding trade-offs in the assessment. Other considerations, such as regulatory customer demands and internal business considerations and preferences may affect choices of alternatives or ones that may be excluded from further analysis. It is important to think through all of the factors that will be important for a substitution decision. What matters for the decision? What's important and less important? What information or experience do we, our competitors, suppliers, or customers have that could help in making a choice of preferred alternatives? Make sure that those issues are explicitly captured in the assessment. If an alternative performs very well on hazard, performance, and cost, but you determine that it's not a great choice for a specific reason, for example, concerns about a particular feedstock or end of life recyclability, then that reason should be explicit in your assessment. So you can compare the trade-offs of getting good performance on most factors, but poor performance on those aspects. Sometimes factors that are important for a decision may have little to do with hazards or performance, and so may be outside of the expertise of the group tasked with the analysis. They may also be somewhat intangible or difficult to measure, such as impacts on company reputation or public perception. For example, the look or feel of a product. Nevertheless, if it factors into your decision, it should be made explicit and can be evaluated qualitatively if necessary. This may seem complex and challenging to do. However, there are techniques for dealing with this mountain of information to help integrate it and distill it down so that decisions can be reached. The most important point is to be open and transparent about that information and engage appropriate stakeholders so that you can evaluate trade-offs and understand uncertainties and where additional information may be needed to make an informed decision. Throughout the course of assessing alternatives, you, with the support of the stakeholders you engage, must make a series of decisions. These decisions include selecting relevant assessment criteria and endpoints in the scoping phase, identifying and screening out potential alternatives, and assessing health, ecological, and environmental impacts, technical performance, and economic impacts. The preferred alternatives must also be ranked and selected. Decision-making occurs throughout the assessment process, not just at the end, and as such should be systematically addressed in the assessment. Decision-making is inherently subjective, especially when uncertainties and trade-offs are involved. As such, having a broad lens to compare alternatives using as much information as possible can lead to better decisions. However, no matter how much objective data were used, Subjective decisions in the form of expert judgments based on experience will be needed all through the assessment. At this stage of the assessment, comparing and selecting preferred alternatives, different decision makers considering the same array of information may come to different conclusions and suggest different courses of action. Selecting an alternative or alternatives that involve trade-offs is an inherently subjective process and as such must be transparent. Often decision-making in organizations follows a pattern where those who will make a decision, such as a company director, ask others to do the analysis and recommend a decision. The decision-makers then review the recommendations, question them a bit, and accept or reject them. 
They may not be actually involved in the decision, and as such, their preferences and decision criteria may not be captured in the process, and the end recommendation may be inconsistent with leadership priorities as a result. An alternative to this is to involve the decision makers in the process directly. If that is not possible, then it's advisable that the group doing the assessment aim to fully characterize the trade-offs between alternatives and present those trade-offs to decision makers who would then be able to select an alternative based on their preferences. The decision makers often have a better sense, given their strategic and high-level view of the organization, of what's preferred or acceptable for the organization. If this isn't possible, then the goal should be to clearly demonstrate the trade-offs between alternatives and the rationale for screening out alternatives or selecting preferred alternatives. This way, the decision makers can check for themselves whether the various assumptions or preferences around trade-offs fit for them. We've included a reading for you, Chapter 5, from a report on Safer Product Alternatives Analysis that provides a good overview of the decision context and a review of some techniques we'll be covering when assessing alternatives in an informed substitution context. There are several components to the decision-making process in an alternatives assessment, and they began in session one during the scoping phase of the assessment. What decision will be made based on the assessment? This should have been addressed in the scoping phase of the assessment when goals are defined. What decision-making approach is being used? What decision rules are being used for various assessment components and when considering all attributes together? What techniques are being used to assess and consider uncertainty and trade-offs? We went into detail about number one in the scoping phase. We'll address numbers two through four here. The decision approach is simply the general approach structure or order of the decision-making process used, such as screening, for example, sorting and selecting an initial set of potential alternatives, or generating a final ranking of alternatives. It's important to identify and know the approach by which you are making the decisions through the assessment and be able to document and describe it. Recently, some alternatives assessment frameworks in the U.S. have adopted terms or labels associated with various decision approaches to help discern one approach from another. These include sequential, simultaneous, and mixed hybrid approaches. The point in describing these decision approaches is not to expect that you will follow one or another. The importance is for you to understand conceptually how you and the stakeholders you engage intend to make decisions throughout the process and to be able to document and describe them to others. To read further about these decision approaches, also called decision frameworks, we've included a chapter for you from the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse's Alternatives Assessment Framework. In the next few slides, we'll describe the sequential, simultaneous, and hybrid decision approaches. The sequential approach means making decisions in the order or in sequence of each assessment component. This approach makes decisions along the way in the analysis, screening out poorly performing alternatives as a way of conserving resources and simplifying the number of alternatives considered in the next assessment component. The order of how alternatives are assessed, whether you assess cost first or hazard first, or narrowing to only potentially high-performing options first, is up to stakeholders. The decision approach considers one or more assessment components, hazards, exposure potential, economic feasibility, or technical feasibility in succession or in order. Any alternative that does not perform satisfactorily on the first attribute or assessment criteria, which is often human health impacts or technical feasibility, can be dropped from further consideration. For example, screening out those alternatives that are not preferred because they do not meet critical decision criteria. The remaining alternatives are then evaluated with respect to the next relevant attribute, and the process is repeated until a preferred alternative or set of alternatives is identified and then compared. 
One key advantage of this approach is that it establishes a hierarchy or preferred alternatives given the assessment attributes or criteria considered. A key disadvantage is that it doesn't consider trade-offs well, allowing good performance on one attribute to offset less favorable performance on another attribute. It may also eliminate a viable option that could be modified to address the poor performance in one attribute. A simultaneous decision approach considers all or a set of assessment criteria at the same time. A key advantage of this approach is that it allows for consideration of trade-offs, allowing good performance on one attribute to offset less favorable performance on another for a given alternative. For example, considering an alternative is viable if it isn't a CMR, but may show concern for skin irritation. The main disadvantage to its use is that this approach may require the use of more sophisticated decision analytic methods, such as multi-criteria decision analysis tools, which we'll touch on in a bit, to evaluate trade-offs between impacts. Simple graphical ways and expert judgment may suffice, but sometimes it may be difficult to visualize preferred alternatives if numerous assessment criteria are being compared. The hybrid approach is a mixture of both sequential and simultaneous approaches. For example, if the technical feasibility and economic impact of a, are of particular importance to the decision maker, they may screen out certain alternatives on that basis using a sequential approach and subsequently apply a simultaneous framework to the remaining alternatives. Most decision approaches used in alternatives assessment are likely hybrid in nature many assessments used will screen and winnow down alternatives to conserve resources. Assessments often include methods that apply weighting or ranking schemes for those. Working with stakeholders to establish a common set of rules on which to judge and guide decisions about alternatives is critical to aid the decision process. Use of decision rules is one important approach to formalize and to make more systematic and explicit decisions that occur during the assessment of alternatives. All of us are constantly making informal decisions based on our personal preferences and expert opinion. These rules make decision parameters explicit and help to make the process more formal rather than informal. In the scoping phase of the assessment, we encouraged you to work with stakeholders to establish these decision rules. We saw how these rules can be implemented in the hazard and exposure and cost and performance sessions. Decision rules can be used early in scoping to screen out alternatives based on specific preferences, such as no CMRs, or specific performance criteria or regulatory concern indicators or other factors such as availability of local suppliers. They can be used to guide the quality of data to be used and how data gaps will be considered. Sometimes decision rules are inherent in the choice of method or tool used to support the assessment. For example, if you used green screen method for assessing hazards, which was introduced to you in session three, decision rules are already included in how data gaps are considered, how uncertainty is considered, and weights applied to specific endpoints over others when determining benchmark scores. Additional decision rules come into play in the final decision-making stage of the assessment. As we've mentioned throughout this training, it's important to anticipate that when assessing alternatives, trade-offs are likely to occur, whether it's between hazard endpoints or trade-offs between hazard and performance or performance and cost. Uncertainty is also an overlapping factor when integrating data to select preferred alternatives. As a reading for this session, we've provided a chapter from the U.S. National Research Council's report, A Framework to Guide the Selection of Safer Chemicals, on this topic, integrating information from the assessment considering trade-offs and uncertainty. The next few slides are based on information in that chapter. Note that the reading focuses on integrating health-related information, but the lessons and tools apply more broadly including the integration of cost and performance information when making decisions.
This slide presents a matrix of a hypothetical hazard assessment that compares alternatives A and B against the chemical of concern, noted here as C in the first row, associated with six human health endpoints, two ecotoxicity endpoints, and two physiochemical hazard endpoints. The hazards are categorized as high H, medium M, or low L. The color scheme used indicates the level of uncertainty. Dark blue is known, light blue, limited uncertainty, pink, high uncertainty, gray, missing data or data gap. In this example, there are both trade-offs and issues of uncertainty. For alternative A, there are moderate concerns for carcinogenicity based on data that has limited uncertainty, and there are data gaps for reproductive toxicity. For alternative B, acute aquatic toxicity is considered of high concern with limited uncertainty and low concern, but low uncertainty for other human health attributes, but no data for neurotoxicity. Concern for persistence and bioaccumulation are also low. You can imagine similar tables to compare options based on performance, comparative exposure, and cost. There is no correct strategy to making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. However, there are various strategies to consider. For example, you could exclude options with missing data. In this approach, only alternatives with data for priority endpoints are considered, and alternatives with unknown toxicity for critical endpoints are excluded. A potential negative to this approach is that it may discriminate against newer, safer chemicals that have less available data you could penalize data gaps. In this strategy, uncertainty regarding a particular endpoint or attribute results in a less favorable evaluation of the alternative. For example, as we described in session three on hazard and exposure assessment, in the green screen hazard assessment process, alternatives with data gaps for specific endpoints are downgraded in the benchmark score. You could use additional tools testing or expert knowledge to reduce data gaps. This approach would involve using tools such as structure activity relationships, high throughput data, and other tools to fill data gaps on the hazard of an alternative, or conducting additional performance testing to fill data gaps in or uncertainties about technical feasibility. An expert review panel can also help understand whether uncertainty is sufficient to eliminate alternative from consideration given the potential consequences of being wrong. You could use quantitative uncertainty analysis. Uncertainty and toxicity values, for example, could be expressed quantitatively or illustrated graphically, expressed as a probability distribution. With this strategy, it is easier to see that one alternative is preferable to another if shown in a clear illustration. While useful, this may be more of an academic strategy and will require additional expertise than most organizations may have in-house. Lastly, you could remain neutral about uncertainty and missing data. In this strategy, the presence of uncertainty and missing data are simply noted, but no alternative is excluded or penalized as a result. This strategy may be useful if conducting the assessment using the sequential decision approach described earlier assessing one component after another, meaning you conduct the hazard evaluation, exposure, cost, and performance one right after the other. This avoids prematurely removing potentially safer alternatives from the evaluation process. It is important to use this strategy only if the alternative with unknown uncertainty concerns appears to be preferable with regard to critical endpoints of concern to your stakeholders. To help navigate and make decisions when there are trade-offs among the alternatives, many assessment of alternatives practitioners choose to use simple comparison matrices, red, yellow, green, or plus and minus, or some other ranking scheme are often used as shown in these examples. The example on the left is the assessment results of an assessment of alternatives conducted by the French government agency ANSIS for use of formaldehyde in animal feed to reduce ruminal degradation. The example on the right 
is for an assessment of alternatives to lead in wheel weights conducted by the Massachusetts Toxics Use Reduction Institute. The benefit of this strategy is that it is simple to execute. It is a useful approach, especially if you are not the entity making a decision about an alternative, such as government authorities or NGOs that are conducting the assessment. Displaying alternatives this way allows others to choose a preferred option based on their values and preferences. This approach is also useful for brands that may want to display preferable alternatives for their contract manufacturers. A primary drawback of this approach is that it may be difficult to see clear preferred alternatives if a large number of alternatives were included in the assessment, numerous endpoints or assessment criteria are addressed, and if uncertainty and trade-offs abound. In your reading, which is a chapter from the U.S. National Research Council report, a framework to guide the selection of chemical alternatives, there is a long discussion on a number of strategies and techniques for considering varying degrees of trade-offs, the horizontal axis in the matrix shown, and varying degrees of uncertainty, the vertical axis, when making decisions in an assessment of alternatives. We're going to examine two situations as depicted in this matrix low uncertainty but multiple trade-offs, the yellow quadrant, and high uncertainty and multiple trade-offs, the red quadrant. First off, let's take a look at a situation where the assessment yields multiple trade-offs across assessment endpoints or criteria, but uncertainty in the data used is low, the yellow quadrant in the matrix shown. You could consider, one, rule-based ranking. Preferences can be ordered by a series of logical statements. The green screen algorithm explicitly specifies the preference ordering of all combinations of toxicological outcomes, considering hazard endpoints and other factors. For rule-based systems, the underlying logic represents an unequal weighting of the importance of a given endpoint, but the weighting process may or may not be explicitly described. The basis for implicit or explicit weighting should be carefully considered before applying a rule-based system to ensure that the organization's values with respect to the different health outcomes are appropriately represented. A key benefit associated with the rule-based ranking is that the organization's value system, once codified in the form of these rules, can be consistently applied to make the alternatives assessment process less prone to an individual's personal judgments or manipulation of the weighting schemes towards otherwise preferred outcomes. The green screen resource handout from session three can provide you more background on rule-based ranking approach. Strict ordering of endpoints. In this strategy, endpoints are strictly ranked such that the highest ranked endpoint, such as carcinogenicity, governs the overall preference ordering. Weighted scoring of endpoints. In this strategy, endpoints are given an unequal weight and the relative score is determined by summing up the weighted scores across all the endpoints. This approach would also require placing a relative weight on the high, medium, and low categories or on the raw toxicity values. A last option is to have equal weighting of all endpoints and to resolve trade-offs by applying weighting in any specific assessment based on the nature of the chemical and application through expert judgment processes. If uncertainty is high and significant trade-offs also exist, this is the red quadrant, an appropriate strategy may be a decision that no alternative is currently acceptable. The decision should be one of focusing on research and development to reduce uncertainty in the understanding of trade-offs, identify additional alternatives, or create a safer, suitable replacement, and use observations about the shortcomings of specific alternatives to guide innovation needs. An expert judgment process may be helpful in these cases to either eliminate specific alternatives for consideration or to identify key information needs that would allow for a more robust comp comparison of existing options. More analytical decision analysis approaches have emerged as useful tools to support decision making in an assessment of alternatives, especially when many alternatives are included in the final comparative evaluation along with many endpoints and assessment criteria. Multi-criteria decision analysis, MCDA, was designed to help evaluate a broad array of different types of information using a decision analytic approach 
to inform decisions about complex problems. There are numerous approaches that fall within the umbrella of MCDA, each using different protocols and algorithms for structuring and using the information gathered in the assessment. The tool should be used to support discussion about preferable alternatives, not replace critical and strategic thinking. In general, the methods involve combining information about the alternative with respect to specific criteria or endpoints used, such as carcinogenicity, cumulative five-year cost or efficacy for components of the assessment, hazard, cost, and performance with subjective judgments about the relative importance of these criteria, also known as weighting, to the overall dis decision. An overall scholar is then produced to inform decisions about feasible and safer replacements. The benefit of this strategy and tool is that MCDA can support decision makers and stakeholders to explore changing their preferences or weights for the different attributes and observe how the final scores for the alternatives change. In addition, use of MCDA is a more formal decision approach that can help with consistency and transparency, so long as the methods and results are documented and described. The drawbacks of MCDA is that it requires spe specialized training in specific MCDA techniques and associated tools. In addition, it is difficult for a group of decision makers or stakeholders to make decisions about weighting factors. Groups rarely can agree on the same weights. Regardless of what tool you use to help organize, structure, and display results to help compare and identify preferred alternatives, discussion with decision makers and stakeholders is critical to arriving at a decision about a preferred alternative and ultimately to successful implementation of that alternative. Through dialogue, choices can be narrowed and refined. Considering the benefits, only through dialogue can you dig deeper into why an individual prefers one alternative over another. It may not be just due to an underlying preference of how an alternative performed on a specific endpoint or assessment criteria, but also additional expertise and information that stakeholders can bring into the decision process, including challenges to implementing an alternative. A more nuanced and deeper understanding of the various assessment criteria can be revealed through st stakeholder dialogue than can be displayed in summary tables and matrices. In addition, dialogue can help zero in on what really matters given all of the criteria included in the assessment and help simplify the decision process. Considering the drawbacks, group dialogue is time intensive. In addition, particularly when addressing preferred alternatives where there may be disagreements or controversy regarding the results, such an approach may require an expert facilitator to focus the dialogue and keep the group focused on making a decision. An important indicator of a good decision is that it stands up under scrutiny. In an assessment of alternatives, documentation is critical. A good assessment of alternatives provides explicit documentation of the decision rules, decision approach, assessment criteria, and decision support or analytics used, if any, and the reasoning behind the course of action selected, whether it be the selection of an alternative or the need for continued R&D because no safer or feasible alternative was identified. This permits transparency, a core principle of assessing alternatives as reviewed in session one, the scoping phase, and allows the parameters of the decision to be interpreted and understood by other parties. You need not make the same decision as uh, some other entity conducting a similar assessment of the chemical of concern for the same application, but people need to follow the rationale behind the decision reached. Now you're going to hear from my colleague, Tim Malloy. Tim is a professor of law and faculty director of the University of California, Los Angeles Sustainable Technology and Policy Program. Tim is a leading expert on the use of various decision-making techniques in the context of alternatives assessment. He provides us with his high-level lessons learned, especially when using software-driven tools like multi-criteria decision analysis and associated tools such as multi-attribute utility theory. We've included a journal article that Tim and colleagues published in Environmental Health Perspectives that goes into greater detail on a number of techniques used to support decision-making when assessing alternatives. 
Hi, my name's Tim Malloy. I'm a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. And um, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the work that we've been doing on decision making in the context of alternative assessment. Um, as you may have heard, there are a variety of tools and different approaches that are used to assist folks when they're making decisions. And many of these tools and approaches are now available in, a, in various types of software that make the process uh, in a lot of ways much easier. We've been spending a fair amount of time over the last few years doing research into um, how useful these tools are, what are some of their benefits, and what are some of their pitfalls. And I'd like to share with you some of the, uh, some of the conclusions we've been able to draw from the studies that we've done. And some of those studies have involved actually uh, bringing folks into uh, our lab and having them use these different approaches and then um, taking a look at what kind of results they got, both substantively the decisions they made, but also how they felt about the decision making. So based on this research, um, there's really three important points that I'd like to make. Um, first is, as useful as these tools and methods are, and in particular, uh, how useful the software tools can be. Um, one thing is clear, which is um, we have to keep our eye on the ball that the important part of decision making um, is the discussion, the dialogue, and kind of the thinking and deliberation that goes into making the decision. These tools can help you organize information. They can help you sort through what's important to you and see the relationships between uh, various uh, criteria that you're trying to make a decision um, about. But one has to be careful to make sure they don't take over the decision because ultimately they produce outcomes that are intended to enhance discussion and deliberation and not replace it. That's a very important point, I think, in assessing some of these tools. Uh, another conclusion we came to is that um, while the variety of the, the tools and approaches um, is terrific to have, um, one needs to be careful in picking a tool that it matches your particular needs, the decision context in which you're operating, and also your capacity. You know, uh, what amount of uh, time and training are you willing to invest or able to invest in learning how to use the tool? Um, how sophisticated does the tool really have to be for the decision context that you find yourself in? So taking these sorts of things into consideration are very important in finding the right fit between the tool or approach or software that you're looking at and the decision that you have to make. And then lastly, one thing that we found both among decision makers and also among the folks who uh, use or, or uh, consider um, the those decisions is uh, the principle that you, you ought to always try to show your work. Uh, particularly when you're using software, it's important to make sure that the user and also um, you know, folks who uh, uh, look at your decision making have sufficient information and documentation for them to understand what supported your decision, what you considered, what kinds of things you took into account, and what role the tool or software or approach that you use actually played in that decision making. So like most other areas, transparency and accountability are important. And one of the most uh, effective ways of making sure that they're in place is to show your work. We've come to the end of this portion of the session, comparing alternatives and making decisions. Remember that there are multiple decision approaches that can be used to assist in making decisions when multiple criteria are being considered. Use what works best for you. There are multiple strategies for navigating trade-offs and considering uncertainty. Use what works best for you in those cases. Ultimately, it is critical to have a consistent and systematic approach to support your process of comparing alternatives, addressing uncertainty, and ultimately choosing preferred options. Of key importance is to document your decision process used. Remember, transparency is a key underlying principle for the assessment of alternatives process. You've completed the assessment. 
you've either identified a preferred alternative or set of alternatives, or noted that no safer feasible alternative is available and additional research is needed to identify new options. Now it's time to implement your decisions. While assessment of alternatives can be a complex process, implementing those alternatives can be even more complex and requires an equally systematic and comprehensive process. The goal of this implementation step is to either substitute the chemical of concern with a preferred alternative while avoiding unintended consequences, or if no preferred alternative is identified, to develop and advance a research and development strategy and timeline for developing a safer feasible replacement for the hazardous chemical of concern. If you're continuing to use the hazardous chemical of concern while research development is occurring, you need to also implement all feasible toxic use reduction and exposure minimization strategies while the chemical of concern is still in use. You've gone through all the assessment steps, scoping, identifying alternatives, evaluating and comparing alternatives associated with hazard, exposure, cost and performance characteristics, and have made decisions regarding a preferred alternative or preferred alternatives or that no alternative is considered safer and or feasible. What next? Implement your decisions. Remember, the assessment of alternatives is action oriented. It's about applying the results of the assessment and it is not the last step in the informed substitution process. For example, the company of Vlisco, a Dutch manufacturer of unique batik print textiles for the African market, evaluated a range of alternatives to trichloroethylene, or TCE, used in its manufacturing process as part of its analysis of alternatives required under the REACH authorization process. The company weighed existing alternatives and found that they presented unacceptable trade-offs in either hazards or technical performance. The company proposed an innovative new green chemistry solution called switchable solvents and is working with a startup company to evolve the technology for their manufacturing process. In the meantime, the company is undertaking closed loop processes to reduce use and minimize exposure to TCE. Although the assessment of alternatives process has helped to identify a preferred alternative and identify and hopefully avoid unintended consequences of substitution, some challenges may not have been anticipated. They only arise when trying to adopt the alternative. For example, there may be changes to product or process. Identified acceptable alternatives may require process design or formulation chemistry changes to achieve functionality that may not have been fully considered during the assessment, or an alternative may simply not achieve adequate performance in specific applications and need to be reevaluated. These additional changes may affect product quality or may lead to increased or modified exposures or new hazards. Changes in work practices. Implementing alternatives may require work practices that can affect worker exposure pathways, increase potential hazards, including physical hazards, and affect productivity if they do not work well. Changes in end-of-life considerations. Substitution with the preferred alternative may make the end-of-life collection and recycling more challenging or lead to unexpected end-of-life exposure concerns. Continuous improvement needs. New information about the toxicity of a chemical substitute or a chemical used alongside the substitute in a process or product may emerge and cast new light on uncertainties in the original assessment. New information about environmental fate or life cycle impacts may require adjustment of earlier data used in the assessment. A company's operations cannot be reconfigured overnight. Substitution is often a complex process involving capital investment, reformulation, supply chain management, workplace changes, and changing consumer preferences. Substitution is about adoption and adaptation, moving toward adopting one or more alternatives and adapting the existing system to make use of knowledge gained in the assessment process and to mitigate problems that may arise. In order to implement a preferred alternative and optimize the likelihood of a successful substitution process, consider undertaking the following steps, which we will go into more detail in the following slides. Making the business case, pilot testing, implementation plan, monitoring and evaluation.
preferably key decision makers that have the authority to approve a substitution were involved in the assessment of alternatives process. They are obviously a key stakeholder to achieve the goal of substituting a specific hazardous chemical of concern with a safer feasible alternative. Yet for some larger organizations, it's infeasible for top executives to be involved in the assessment process. Now that the results are in, you will need to make the business case for substitution to those that can authorize the process to proceed. Elements you need to make the business case are found in the assessment itself. You have the case for health and safety, performance and cost. Only you know what to emphasize given the strategic priorities of your company. Remember from the introduction, the case for substitution can be made on several grounds, including decreasing risks and costs due to regulation, public relations problems, consumer confidence, and liabilities. Creating opportunity, including innovation, and giving your company competitive advantage in the marketplace. Providing continuous improvement in terms of improved efficiencies or broader improvements to sustainability efforts. And lastly, it is simply the right thing to do for human health and the environment, including worker morale and safety. In the technical feasibility assessment step, we outline three possible assessment tiers, from the quick and easy to the more comprehensive and complicated. If pilot tests were not conducted as part of the technical feasibility assessment component, or level three, consider undertaking a pilot test or small scale testing of the preferred alternative to identify issues related to performance of alternatives, including process or product modifications that are needed to make the alternative function to specifications and two, changes in product or process chemistries or work practices, both in product manufacture or use, that might affect worker or consumer health or the efficacy of the alternative. It is important to engage stakeholders such as customers in these pilot tests and small scale testing so that they are more likely to see the results that meet their specifications or expectations and remain or become customers especially for product manufacturers, involvement and communication with customers is critical in order to, for the substitute to be taken up into the market and by downstream users. Adopting a substitute is a complicated process and it may take significant time. It is important to develop a step-by-step -step implementation plan that outlines the who, the organizational structure and roles involved, the what, the processes involved, including processes for obtaining feedback, and the when, realistic timelines for implementing, monitoring, evaluating, and communicating with stakeholders, such as workers, customers, and regulators about the substitution. Rather than making an abject, abrupt change in direction, it may be more appropriate to consider a gradual adoption process that combines ongoing efforts to improve understanding of the benefits, drawbacks, and impacts involved in the changes being made. A resulting adaptation strategy can then follow as needed. The implementation plan should also include adequate time for worker training in order to effectively implement necessary changes in processes or technologies. The plan should also include processes to obtain feedback from workers and customers in order to problem solve issues that arise and minimize unintended consequences, such as loss in worker productivity, changes in use, or exposure miscalculations given real world experiences. Lastly, it is important to anticipate the need for additional research and the development of mitigation strategies that may arise. Monitoring and evaluating the adoption process will help ensure that the substitution meets all needs and expectations. Monitoring and evaluation are essential to early identification of potential unintended consequences of the adoption process. This may include tracking the actual impacts on worker health and safety, performance and efficiency of the tasks or processes, sales, and services. Overarching questions to consider include, did we succeed? Did we achieve the goals we set out to? What went well? What were the challenges? What improvements should we make and how? Monitoring needs are context dependent and could involve simple measures such as air and water monitoring or waste audits, periodic industrial hygiene evaluations, discussions with workers about the impacts of the transition, 
and discussions with customers about their experiences. It is also important to keep yourself informed of any new alternatives. There may be safer, better performing, less costly innovations coming on the market in the future that would benefit your operation. In the assessment, you made decisions based on the best available information at the time, but new information is to be anticipated, especially for newer chemistries, materials, and technologies. Alternatives that were not selected in the assessment may be reconsidered in the future as their viability may evolve with the changing information landscape. Lastly, it is important to log your implementation experience. Not only will it inform additional substitution processes in the future, it can be also used to build best practices that support the informed substitution of hazardous substances. Remember, substitution is a continuous improvement process and decisions should be regularly revisited and updated. You underwent significant effort to evaluate potential alternatives, but no alternative was identified that was both safer and feasible. This results in the need to develop a research and development strategy to develop, test, and implement an alternative that does meet your needs for safety and feasibility. In this strategy, you might consider partnering with an academic institution to share your substitution challenge and harness the research and development expertise of academia, which may not be present in your company. Working with supply chain collaborators, as well as innovators such as startups that may have alternative solutions, and establishing partnerships along the value chain that can help share the cost of research, evaluation, performance testing, including leveraging the use of partners testing facilities to help de drive not just innovation, but also the commercialization of safer chemicals and technologies. As an example, the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, a cross-sectoral value chain business-to-business -business network, created its collaborative innovation project for safe and effective preservatives to solve a safer alternatives problem facing a number of firms. In that project, two retailers and 11 consumer product brands collaborated to develop criteria for safe and effective preservatives for consumer products to conduct an open innovation challenge and then evaluate the performance and health and safety attributes of a number of innovative solutions. So you need to continue using the hazardous chemical of concern while you're undertaking research and development to find a safer and feasible substitute. This should not mean a return to business as usual. Make sure all strategies to reduce your use of the hazardous substance have been implemented. For example, you may undertake a toxics reduction or pollution prevention planning process to identify possible process modifications or improved operations and maintenance to use the chemical of concern more efficiently or less of it, or in process recycling to reuse rather than purchase and use more of the chemical of concern. You may also consider a chemical service strategy, such as chemical leasing, to more effectively manage a chemical of concern. Where you cannot reduce the use, make sure all engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment for workers are operating effectively. To summarize key points when implementing decisions about alternatives, expect challenges when implementing your substitution decision. It's a complicated process and requires as much attention to systematic planning and understanding trade-offs as the assessment of alternatives process. Adopting an alternative may require you to make the business case, conduct additional pilot testing, create an implementation plan, and undertake additional monitoring and evaluation. If your decision is to implement an, a research and development strategy to develop the necessary safer and feasible alternative, Make sure processes are in place to maximize all possible pollution prevention and industrial hygiene controls while continuing to use the chemical of concern. We've come to the end of this assessment of alternatives training. Let's revisit our learning objectives. As a result of these five training sessions, you should now be able to, one, understand the importance of scoping and engaging stakeholders early on to improve the assessment process and adoption experience. Number two, know what types of potential alternatives to consider and where to look for them. Three, access new methods and tools to assist in the comparative assessment process. Four, 
no strategies for addressing uncertainty in the assessment and reconciling trade-offs when making decisions, and five, understand strategies for implementing the results of the assessment, linking it with continued improvement processes. We hope that this training spurred your interest for continued learning and practice. Assessment of alternatives is a growing field and it needs your contributions and experience to build best practices to support a transition away from the use of hazardous chemicals and towards the use of safer chemicals, materials, and technologies. If you would like to receive an official certification of completion, the next step is to take the certification exam that you can find in the next section.